In part one, we examined the evidence for the Alaskan mine. And in this part, we will examine Velikovsky's evidence for the Ivory Island. The Ivory Islands are famous for being a major exporter of ivory. The ivory does not come from living animals, but from the carcasses of mammoths which have been extinct for millennia. There are believed to be as many as 10 million of these buried under the permafrost. It is not just the bones that have been preserved in the frost. In 1797, the body of a mammoth with flesh, skin and hair was found in northeastern Siberia. And since then, bodies of mammoths have been unearthed from frozen grounds in various parts of that region. The flesh had the appearance of freshly frozen beef. It was edible, and wolves and sledge dogs fed on it without harm. Velikovsky used the natural historian Bassett Digby as his source for this information. When examining Digby's work, he used the German entomologist Alfred Otto Hertz as his source. Otto led an expedition to Siberia to recover the carcass of a mammoth. He wrote a report which Digby quotes, and in it he states, The flesh from under the humerus, sinewy and marbly with fat, is dark red and looks as fresh as well-frozen meat. For some time we wondered whether or not we should try tasting it. So appetizing did it look. But no one could bring themselves to place such food in his mouth. Horse meat was preferred. The dogs, however, gladly ate the mammoth meat that was thrown to them. Other accounts exist of similar expeditions to recover carcasses. The first ever recovered was called the Adam's Mammoth, and it was discovered in 1799 by a local hunter and recovered by the Russian botanist Mikhail Ivanovich Adams. He also noted that the flesh was edible. The jackouts of the neighborhood tore off the flesh with which they fed their dogs. Ferocious animals, white bears of the North Pole, gluttons, wolves and foxes preyed upon it also, and their burrows were seen in the neighbourhood. The skeletons, almost completely unfleshed, was entire with the exception of one of the forefeet. Velikovsky's next source was a Protestant clergyman who believed that modern science was an aid, not a hindrance, to his Christian faith. Reverend D. Gath Whitley, use science to interpret the Bible. In his writings on the frozen carcasses, he drew the obvious conclusion. These carcasses are, when discovered, quite perfect and have been preserved in this condition by the perpetual frozen soil in which they are buried. It is therefore absolutely necessary to believe that the bodies were frozen up immediately after the animals died and were never once thawed until the day of their discovery. No other theory will explain the perfect preservation of these bodies of these great elephants. He goes on to point out that the remains of the mammoth and other species of megafauna were found all over Siberia. Their number increased the further north you travelled. The highest concentrations were found in the New Siberian Islands. The soil of these desolate islands is absolutely packed full of bones of elephants and rhinoceroses in such astonishing numbers that no place in the whole world contains such quantities of elephant remains as do these icy islands in the Arctic Sea. And these were not just found on dry land. It is equally wonderful that the bed of the sea around the New Siberian Islands seems to be covered with the tusks and teeth of elephants, which are being constantly washed up by waves on the sea bank round the shores of these islands. He also tells us that when the Vega was sailing past Likov's island, the trawl net brought up from the bottom some fragments of mammoth tusks which confirmed the statement of the ivory hunters and showed that there must be an immense deposit of elephant bones under the sea at this place. His final summary was overly dramatic. Speaking geologically, in recent times, the regions north of Siberia enjoyed a milder climate than they possess now. At this time, a great tract of country must have extended from the mouth of Lena to the New Siberian Islands, and it stood at a considerable level above the sea. 
while the islands which now exist in the ocean in that region formed upland districts and mountain ranges. This ancient land was covered with forests and was traversed by the great Siberian rivers. Vast herds of elephants, rhinoceroses, musk oxen and buffaloes roamed over the grassy plains and wandered amidst the forests, and for long they enjoyed a peaceful and secure home. A great catastrophe at last overtook them. The land in the extreme north of Siberia sank beneath the waters of the polar sea. As the waters rose higher and higher, the animals crowded to the upland for safety and congregated in enormous numbers on the mountain tops. The land, however, continued to sink and the waters rose higher and higher. The tops of the highest hills were at last submerged and the destruction was complete. After a time, the land began to rise slowly, and the New Siberian and Likov Islands, which had formed mountains in the land, rose above the waters. As they had formed a last refuge of animals when the land was submerged, they were naturally covered with the bones, teeth, and tusks of the animals which had been drowned upon them. Currents also in the water swept the bones into various places, accumulating them here and there in large deposits. The climate also at this time underwent a great change and altered from one of a mild and genial character to one of intense cold and arctic severity. At the end of Whitley's paper, there are some additional comments by two other members of the Victoria Institute, Henry Howarth and Edward Hull. It is from Henry Howarth that Velikovsky took the assertion that Charles Darwin was troubled by the extinction of the mammoth and that the eyeballs of some of the mammoth were preserved and that they must have died suddenly. Henry Howarth further stated that the content of the stomachs had been carefully examined. They showed the undigested food, leaves of trees now found in southern Siberia, but a long way from the existing deposits of ivory. Microscopic examination of the skin showed red blood corpuscles which was proof not only of a sudden death, but that the death was due to suffocation either by gases or water. Evidently the latter is the case, but the puzzle remains to account for the sudden freezing up of this large mass of flesh so as to preserve it for future ages. Henry Howarth was but an amateur, so Velikovsky had to use other more qualified experts to back up his claim. He turned to George Kuntz, who was a renowned mineralogist. His book, Ivory and the Elephant, documents a complete history of ivory from the evolution of the elephant to the ivory trade itself. On page 236, he cites Whitley's theory that the extinction of the mammoth was caused by the gradual sinking of the land, but then adds, however, we are usually taught to regard geological changes as extremely gradual so gradual that the adjustment of living organisms to the changing conditions is greatly favoured. Here, however, many of the observed facts would rather seem to point to a sudden and unexpected cataclysm. He then repeats Howarth's comment on Darwin and points out the undigested contents of the mammoth stomach. Not only did they discover vast amounts of mammoth remains, but the Ivory Islands held another surprise vast expanses of petrified forests, and this means that the wood had changed and turned into stone. Velikovsky stated by quoting Ferdinand von Wrangel's narrative on an expedition to Siberia and the Polar Sea. On the southern coast of New Siberia, he says, are found the remarkable wood hills. They are 30 fathoms, which is 55 meters high, and consist of horizontal strata of sandstone alternating with strata of bituminous beams or trunks of trees. On ascending these hills, fossilized charcoal is everywhere, covered apparently with ashes, but on closer examination, this ash is also found to be a petrification, and so hard that it can scarcely be scraped off with a knife. On the summit, another curiosity is found namely a long row of beams resembling the former, but fixed perpendicular in sandstone. The ends, 
which project from 7 to 10 inches, are for the most part broken. The whole has the appearance of a ruinous dyke. Although Velikovsky cites Ferdinand from Wrangel's book, he is in fact using the references from Whitley's paper. He uses Whitley's paper to extract more references and quotes George Adolf Ehrman's Travels Around the Earth to corroborate Hayden Strom's Woodhill account. He then also quotes two sets of anonymous notices in the Journal of the Royal Geographical Society about two separate expeditions to the region. Whitley concludes his paper by stating that the New Siberian islands were densely forested in the days of the megafauna. But there is not substantiating evidence to confirm if this is in fact the case, or whether the trees were uprooted elsewhere and deposited around the New Siberian islands. In the final part of the chapter, Velikovsky compares the Alaskan muck to the Siberian muck and suggests that the mammaliferous deposits in both cases share a common cause. In the case of the Alaskan muck, many claim that both Hibben and Rainey exaggerated the number of bones and carcasses discovered. This cannot be said about the Siberian finds, as they managed to produce a very successful economy out of selling this ivory for a long time, and this continues to this day. So is there any more up-to-date information to back up some of these ideas or to suggest otherwise? Now there are a number of Soviet scientists who have studied the paleofauna in the Arctic. Nikolai Vereshagin is one of the most renowned and has published over 500 papers. He never disputes the abundance of the mammoth remains in the Siberian deposits. He was, however, not a catastrophist. He thought that these deposits were windborne low-sick silts, just like the Alaskan muck deposits. On the megafauna, he does agree that there is a lack of consensus. He viewed that the mammoth extinction was primarily caused by the radical alteration of the climates at the end of the last glaciation epoch. This is odd as the main consensus is that the climate actually improved after the Ice Age rather than got colder. In order to count for this, they implied that the thawing of the Arctic basin and the melting of the ground ice led to the fodder-rich tundra being transformed into moist, boggy, mossy tundra. And this meant that there was no place for the mammoths. Looking at the tundra today, there is no way that mammoths or bison could hope to survive there. So how did they do it in the past? And what about the petrified trees? If we examine the current tree line in Siberia, it does not reach the Arctic coast. And in a more recent study of the ancient trees, MacDonald states, the northern tundra zone of the continental Eurasia contains an important fossil archive related to the past distribution of tree species during the late Pleistocene and Holocene. From Fenoscandia to eastern Siberia, hundreds of wood micro and mega fossils of Pinus, Picea, Larix and Betula trees have been found in locations north of the modern range limits. In northern Russia, such samples, including bark, cones, needles and large logs, have been discovered on the tundra surfaces and in the peats alluvial deposits, colluvial deposits and lake sediment. The problem is that no one has really addressed why these trees were more plentiful further north when it was supposed to be much colder. I see that there are two possibilities. The first is that the climate was not as they described, but for whatever reason it was much more temperate in Siberia during the last ice age. The second is that the trees and carcasses were somehow transplanted from a great distance where it was more temperate to Siberia. Interestingly, in a more recent paper published in the New Scientist, scientists suggest that parts of Alaska and Siberia remained ice-free during the last ice age and became a refuge for life. They extracted samples from the frozen sediment and they examined the fungi which, as part of a complex ecosystem, feeds on plants and other plant matter. They identified 40 different fungal types, which was much higher than they had expected to find. 
and this suggested that there was a thriving plant community at this time. A different group of scientists studied the DNA and pollen to reconstruct the plant life around a lake in the northern peninsula of Siberia. They identified 60 different species of plants with dates ranging from 46,000 to 12,000 years ago. And this suggested that the environment remained relatively stable across a much greater span of time. So the question remains, even if this is true and there is this refuge that existed in northern Siberia and in Alaska, why was it there in the first place? If this was an ice age, why were certain parts of Alaska and Siberia ice-free? Unraveling this mystery is something that we will need to come back to in future episodes. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.